Today, we are going to engage in another very interesting conversation. This conversation is about reverts and the Islamic and or Muslim culture. So inshallah, we'll be tackling this particular issue today with my regular guests, Sister Amina and Brother Bilal. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum If I could start with you, Brother Bilal, this question of Islamic culture, what is the difference between what you understand to be Islamic culture as opposed to Muslim culture? Is there a difference? And if so, what is it? I, I think there's a difference, um, subtle difference, and um, sometimes easily missed. But um, I guess the Islamic culture is specific. I look at it from my understand, limited understanding that it's specifically to do what, with what is revealed in, in, from the Quran, revealed from the Sunnah of the Prophet and from the Imma. This is this is the, the behavioral traits. This this outlook, as we we were speaking um, about some time in the past, about um, the Islamic worldview or Islamic etiquette. Um, these these um, behavioral traits, these cognitive processes, these these ways of looking at things, directly related from a, a religious or a spiritual, you know, coming coming through the example of the Prophet and from the example of the Imams and the revelation itself. Primarily, Muslim culture. When I think of that, what comes to mind is more how civilizations and societies have taken on this, and then it's their take or their modus operandi, their way of operating within within the confines. So while um, you know, in Egypt, for example, as a country, you know, there may be a way of of doing things which is halal and it's, it's permissible within Islam, but it's different to how that may take place. That same take that thing may take place in somewhere like Malaysia. And that's where you find that in some Muslim societies, women, for example, don't go to the mosque which is permissible and at the same time you know there's mosques which facilitate and Muslim societies where you know women do go to the mosque and there's um, areas and, and places and programs that are facilitated specifically for women or on joint occasions and um, I guess both are acceptable but that would be more to do with culture mm. and sometimes some people some people coming from a particular cultural perspective try to then say oh this is haram or this is free mixing or this is you know and then and it's really a matter of culture okay know? I definitely do think there is such a thing as Islamic culture, as you were saying, but we need to be very careful in this discussion because culture is a very sensitive word and we have a couple extremes. Uh, we have the one which I think you were alluding to, that some people who perhaps haven't had the opportunity in life to perhaps gain a comprehensive awareness of the Muslim Ummah and Islamic history do confuse culture and religion, and it's basically what I saw my father's doing is Islam. Whether or not it really is Islamic or not, we know that there are all sorts of things that happen in every culture uh, that are um, perhaps, for example, oppressive towards women or, or something else. So they're not really Islamic, even if Muslim people are doing them. So because of that, we have the tendency to try to sift out culture and religion. We want religion without culture. And obviously, if it's the bad things we're talking about, you know, uh, depriving women of their human rights or institutionalized classism or whatever it is, we do want to take out the bad stuff. But that doesn't mean that culture in and of itself is something that we can or should try to remove from the human being mm -hmm. because culture is how we interact with the world. You can't exist as a human being without a culture. If you think you don't have a culture, you probably just simply have the same culture as everyone else around you and don't notice it. Uh, mm -hmm. That being said, I, I do believe there is Islamic culture. And Islamic culture is not, for instance, Turkish culture or Egyptian culture or a, a cultural culture, but I would say it's the sum total of the values, the ideas and beliefs that you have uh, by dedicating yourself to being a practicing Muslim. And this is why, for example, you can bring together Muslims, whether in the Hajj, whether in an organization, in an Islamic school, whatever it is, from vastly different regions of the world. But there is a common understanding. We know, for example, how it feels to fast during the month of Ramadan. We know how it feels to, um, I, I don't know, to try to deal with scarf pins as a lady. So we understand <laughs> that there is a sort of I would call it a cultural understanding among practicing Muslims and an idea of how we should address life's problems, for example, addressing it Quranically and so forth. Uh, but this is not at all the same thing as an ethnic culture. And as you mentioned, there is definitely overlap. Uh, and I think uh, while at the same time we are 
very rightly trying to remove the negative elements of various ethnic Islamic cultures. So for example, wrong ways of doing things that are restrictive or harmful to people. It's worthwhile, I think, to embrace the good ones. Um, people have been worshipping as Muslims for more than a thousand years, have been building Islamic universities and houses and doing many good things. Uh, and it's important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. But in answer to your question, yes, that's what I would call Islamic culture. Those things which have uh, bound the ummah, the mm. practicing ummah, throughout centuries and centuries, uh, which may or may not be the same as a particular ethnic culture. I think you mentioned in Hajj is quite uh, an interesting point to take on board. And alhamdulillah, all three of us have been to Hajj, may Allah accept all of our uh, uh, pilgrimages, inshallah. But I suppose with this question that we're tackling at the moment of Islamic versus Muslim culture, I think we can see this, and again, you've both raised the point that culture in of itself is not something negative. Hajj is a perfect illustration of that, and what I'm getting at here is one aspect that we could look at is maybe the dress code. Obviously, we're not talking about when everyone's in ihram, because you wouldn't necessarily know where exactly. anyone comes from, but yeah. when people are in their own form of dress you can see the diversity the true diversity of islam you know you see some people in jeans you see some people in this dashes you know and then you've got people from africa in very colorful clothes and then the sarawakamis etc etc mm -hmm. this is surely a, a great illustration of this concept of culture or sorry islam and the mixing with culture as yeah. the Quran says, a sign of Allah too, that this is a sign, the mm. great diversity in his creation and united in worship. Alhamdulillah. And, um, and as you mentioned, if we reflect on that, um, about the Hajj, we specifically were required to leave our cultural garb behind and we're the Ikhram, men and both men and women, so that we're indistinguishable and that's to you know, recall us to our universalness and our sameness, but then we're not after the Hajj said, now this is the robe that <laughs> thou shalt weareth, you know, from henceforth. It just means that we return back to our culture with a, hopefully a higher spiritual awakening that joins us strongly to the, to the, to the human family, to our Muslim universal family, but also, you know, we, we return to our culture. Hmm. What about us reverts, and we're talking specifically from the West here, obviously we have reverts all over the world. So yeah. It's, it, we can't... Uh, it, it's not for any particular geographical location, but obviously we're talking um, about us as Western reverts. What about us? Uh, a lot of what we hear sometimes from Muslims, born Muslims, is that Western culture is anti-Islamic. You know, it's exploitation of, uh, of women, for example. Um, you know, the, the, just the, the behavioural patterns in the West, so on and so forth. Can we say that a Western culture is un-Islamic, therefore when we become Muslims we should move away wholeheartedly from a Western culture? Or is it the same kind of concept that well, some of the West is good, or some of our Western culture is good, and some we need to maybe use Islam as a filtering, a filter if you like, to filter out the, yeah. the, the bad from the good? I, I, sorry, I, uh, Sister Amina, yeah. sorry, apologies. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, again, there's many layers to this question. I mean, to some degree, you can't filter out your upbringing, uh, especially the early years have a tremendous impact on how you view the world. Now, your views may change, but it is still part of you. You may acquire additional ideas on top of that, which is fine. There's no law that says you have to keep only the aspects of the culture you were born into. People nowadays, they move many times from country to country and you do encounter new cultures and sometimes change. This is human nature. Um, I, I wouldn't say any culture is more Islamic or less Islamic, with the exception of what I was just mentioning, that some cultures have a history of practicing Islam. For instance, uh, a culture of Sufism, for example, or Irfan. Uh, which is kind of Islam in practice in a specific way, of course, the good parts of Sufism. Uh, but other than that, in terms of the core values, I mean, with American culture, there's certain things I would say are Islamic. There's an expectation that people should be honest, they should care about society, they should try to get along with people from other backgrounds. Those are Islamic values. But there are also many things that are not. And 
I don't like the idea when we really polarize stuff into very good and very bad, you know, this culture is perfect, that culture is, you know, haram, kfar, you know, scandalous, immoral, because life is just so much more complicated than that. And one of the things I've realized is that when we talk about a lot of things that people tend to do in Western, modern Western culture, such as, uh, to, to use a euphemism, courtship rituals, how people go about finding their spouses, sometimes there's dating, sometimes there's, you know, nightclubs or whatever it is, things that we consider very bad. In fact, our ancestors in the West would have probably considered them very bad too. Uh, but people aren't always doing these things just because they want to be immoral and be um, kind of having fun. But this is part of the life process. This is how the culture has adapted to solve a very basic need, which is finding a spouse. Yes. Every culture has a method. Now, in some parts of the world, your parents may select your spouse, especially in the past. In some parts, perhaps it's, you know, 50-50. And nowadays in the West, you are expected to find your spouse by going through certain customs. But as a Muslim, obviously, we cannot and, and do not embrace those as they are. And so these aspects do need to be left behind. You can still connect to it, appreciate the culture, but I don't think you're no longer, you're not 100% part of it as you would be otherwise. Mm. So you don't totally uh, divorce yourself or divorce yourself from the culture, but obviously there are certain elements that you have to leave behind. And they may be very key elements to how people see themselves in their society, especially when it comes to women and so forth, ideals for women, but... You know, again, this is reality. Sure. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm quite fascinated with um, Islamic history and how that, how, how that relates to this subject. Um, the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, moving from, a dec um, from Mecca to Medina at a period of time in history. So a real-life individual, a real historical um, individual. Some things in Islam are beyond uh, history. and You know, uh, things like the, uh, the Salah, the fundamentals of Islam, are beyond a historical dialogue. They just, you know... We accept them as Muslims as, as, as part of the faith. But in terms of how we, how we operate within a culture, we see that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was, was invited to Medina, went to Medina with um, his, his close um, companions and, and the rest of his followers. And we're not aware of him outlawing everything that existed in Medina. Mm -hmm. We're aware of an Islamic um, city-state, for want of a better term, developing and you know certain rules, certain protocols, behavioral traits, certain spiritual practices. Um, coming together to develop this system, what we what we understand as Islam today, but we we you know I'm not aware of any material where you just said that these people are you know munkar, fashad. This is you know indecency, and we just ban everything from that culture. You know, so when we as you met the sister mentioned earlier on about you know the polarization, it's, it is it's quite unrealistic. I mean, we see that anything that was good was seen as Islamic. And, and, and uh, anything that was, was negative was, was something that was shunned, or at least people tried to create a barrier or a distance between themselves and that. And that's one of the things that when you look at various Muslim um, civilizations that's come up, why they seem to excel so quickly in the scheme of things, um, you know, scientifically and, you know, educationally, because the Muslims sort of were, they didn't have this hang-up. You know, they, Islam went into India, and what was, you know, they took the zero, or whatever that was good and would, would, would push things forward and wasn't forbidden by Islam was easily was easily absorbed into Islam and, sure. and those things that those elements that were, were, were seen as you know quite clearly haram, quite clearly har clearly harmful, were just, you know, moved to the side. So I, I think we can take bits of wherever we live. We're supposed to learn from uh, any civilization. I, I, I'm aware of the verse where it says, um, you know, I create you in tribes and nations so you can get to know one another. Yes. And I'm <coughs> you know, I've heard it you know, Islamic scholars say, you know, think about it. It's not just talking about Muslims were made in tribes and nations just to know Muslims. It's just made civilization. So, we, you know, we can learn from even historical countries that didn't have any necessary Muslim uh, heritage. heritage as such. But, you know, like whether it's the Japanese culture, the samurai, there's still things about honor, about integrity, about loyalty, about bravery, and, you know, different aspects of the human character that we could still find intriguing, still mm. learn from. So, you know... Um, it's quite interesting it's as well that we're talking about this polarization as well because of the fact that you, I don't know if this is the case for the two of you, but when I converted to Islam, I had this utopian view of Islam, that there was a place in this world where Islam in its pristine form is being practiced. And it was quite a shock to the system to go and spend some time in 
some parts of the Islamic world, not going to mention any particular areas you oh, know, do, specifically. Bro, do. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is this, that you get there and you see so many elements of so-called Muslim culture that is very un-Islamic. In fact, I came back with the conclusion that th there's a lot Muslims can learn from the way in which life or the culture of the West, there's a lot, if you like, Eastern culture can learn from the West. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you have this situation where sometimes brothers or sisters say, oh, you know, the, the West is such a oppressing place for Muslim to live. I can't live here anymore. And they literally burn all their bridges. Right, I'm going to go and live in the Middle East where it's going to be all hunky-dory and everything's going to be fine because I'm living in a Muslim state. And then reality hits home. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if people always come into Islam thinking there's somewhere that Islam is perfectly practiced. But I think this sense of idealism is usually there. Mm -hmm. um, naive idealism, of course, because we know from our life experience, since we were toddlers, that people do lie and they hit and they steal and they, all, they do all these things. But we expect Muslims all pray five times a day and are fair and honest and just and everything. And... I mean, that can be quite a shock to realize that our community is... People can suffer from the same challenges that people do in every other community. Although, of course, if we are trying to hold to the message, inshallah, we would be the best of people. Um, yes, yeah, so, so that is a challenge. But on the other hand, when we are talking about kind of modern Western culture and everything that big term encompasses, uh, there is a difference, for example, with the Hijra model, and that, of course, is that there have been these centuries of hatred and divorce from Islam and crusades, sort of mm -hmm. the crusade mentality, which in many ways is still carrying on today, um, such as <clears throat> certain people's war on terror and so forth. And so I think when all of us started to practice Islam, there was the idea that in the West that... Um, there isn't really perhaps a place for Muslims in Western culture. Now, you might live here and work here, but you know you need to become like us because you can't be a Western Muslim. And I'm not talking about among the Muslims. I mean talking about neighbors and co-workers and so forth, presidents. And this is changing because there are so many Muslims in the West who are doing sort of integral things in society, whether it's participating in government or the police and so forth, that, um, you know... I, I think that the cultures are changing, but there still is this, well, to go back to that word, there is this polarization that is something beyond values and whether the culture has Islamic values or not, uh, but can it facilitate you to express yourself as a Muslim and live uh, fully the way you should? And of course, as you very rightly said, moving to another country isn't necessarily the solution. There's no guarantee that you will find kind of life fulfillment in another culture or among another people, or that you'll even be accepted. I mean, you may have a very happy life. It just depends. Uh, so it's a challenge, and it's something I, I think we need to work out. And, of course, I think all Muslims living in the West, again, do deal with this. It's not limited to people coming to Islam, just that sometimes the, the, you know, the myth of hijra is sometimes sure. perhaps stronger among us. If we could just shift the focus slightly, and that is, okay... We've come to the conclusion that we should not um, lose everything that is Western about us when we convert to Islam. On the flip side of the coin, when we become Muslims, some Muslims, maybe a very small minority, but some Muslims have this idea that now that you've become a Muslim, you now need to change your identity, your appearance needs to change, you need to dress like me, talk like me, eat like me, etc. So, I mean, we do to an extent, you know, we do because obviously we're hanging around with Muslims now. So, they're, you know, uh, for example, you know, me maybe eating subcontinent food prior to Islam. I think I'd been to an Indian restaurant once in my life. It was a, and it wasn't even a halal one back in those days. You know, forgive me, of course, um, I didn't know any better at the time. But the point is, there, some Muslims, a, a small minority, have this expectation of us that we need to now change. You know, if I'm still going to the masjid in a pair of jeans and trainers, some think that this is an in, improper way for me to dress. Is this something that we should take on board? You know, should I start wearing a dishdasha or wearing sarawak kameez and so on and so forth? Uh, it would be a good thing if, as, as Muslim men if we're identifiable as Muslims in some way. But... Um, 
ultimately it's a, you know it's about individual choice Allah's given us a lot of freedom a lot of a lot of you know a lot of remit to exercise our own prudence and our own choice of what we think is suitable what we can handle what we prefer so you know there is um it is it is individual choice but i don't think it should when it's when things are imposed or um you know on other people then it becomes a kind of cultural colonialism and, and that is what I, I find very difficult that's what i find um you know, I feel a bit resentful at times, you know, Allah forgive me, but I feel, you know, quite strongly about that sometimes when I feel somebody's trying to impose something on me. I mean, it may have very much to do with my background and being, you know, descendant of, of Africans and African Caribbean heritage that, you know, culture or your heritage or your identity is something that's so valuable and, you know, having that in historically been taken away, I'm, I'm, I'm very um, on edge or mm, very, protective. let's say, my, yeah, my, my frustration tolerance is, 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 is quite low. So, you know, um, I guess... You know, I don't. You know, I I don't go for that one, and um, but you know, there I, I can see where brothers are, are, are and sisters are coming from when they because sometimes they, they see people that are converted to Islam and it's like a, a joy and, and and you're one of us, you're one of the family, so they want to bring you into the family, and uh, it's just enthusiasm. But you know, but sometimes it's, it's patronizing. Sometimes it's, it's a kind of cultural colonialism, and um, or sometimes you just use it as a soapbox. Somebody's pent up. They don't really give that. Well, they don't really speak to much people. Maybe non-Muslims people to talk about Islam, and then they find that you took your shahad and they go, "Yeah, because Islam has five pillars, right? And you know the Prophet Muhammad peace, and the Quran is the book." And you're thinking, "No, I know that bit already. Like, you know, <laughs> you're a bit rudimentary for me now. No disrespect, but that's why I came to the mosque because I'm aware of those things, and that's why I took my shahada. So, mm. but it's just because they just, you know, want to speak to someone, just want to, you know, get it out there. So, I, I, I do understand. Where, where that that um, thing about changing you know changing your identity and stuff like that comes from yeah and that's a good reminder too it's always good to look at people and assume they have the best of intentions yes. uh, even though things don't always come out right um i find there's a lot of mixed messages because a lot of times you'll have people tell you just to your face that in islam you don't you shouldn't give up your culture you shouldn't feel like you have to become for example arab or pakistani or anything else so, and they might even criticize you if they feel like you're giving up your culture. You know, like, sister, why would you want to change your name? You know, I don't know, Daphne is a perfectly good Muslim name. And they, they kind of don't realize what it's like to go into a job interview where they expect Daphne and they get, I don't know, Delia or something instead. So you kind of have sometimes people pressuring you to, to, to fit into what they expect a Westerner to be like, to dress how they would expect a Westerner to dress, to eat and want to do what they would expect. On the other hand, the pressure is, gen I find, at least among women, it's, it's not conscious that people don't come up to you and say, we want you to acculturate, but they will judge you if you are different, which I think is also human nature. Um, you know, as kids know, for example, you join a new group of friends at school, you learn very quickly to do things as they do them, otherwise they're going to kind of laugh at you and kick you out, and it may not necessarily be laughed at, but for example... Um, among women, I think this is a big issue. Every culture has different standards of modesty. What is appropriate behavior for a woman? How loud do I speak? What colors do I wear? Do I, can men see my face, for example? Or do I sort of hide in the corner? And this is not at all the same from one Muslim culture to another. Mm -hmm. But you learn very quickly among certain environments that if I do something, which may be completely acceptable Islamically, may also be acceptable in other Muslim countries, if I do it among them, I'm going to get a lot of looks, a, a lot of sort of shame and embarrassment. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's not intentional sort of pressuring people to acculturate, but it just happens because not everyone really understands multiculturalism or embraces it. Now, this is all people. Obviously, there's tons of people in the West who don't embrace other cultures either and who aren't tolerant. And I do think in these sorts of situations, it, it is good to be pragmatic. And that is... Um, if you're dealing with a culture which is not your birth culture, and there's a lot of people in this situation in the world, but you know, one of the special circumstances people in the West who come to Islam deal with, especially in the Shi'i community, is usually you'll be dealing with a lot of people who are not from your birth culture. Now, in some places that's not true, especially in the U.S. there's much bigger uh, revert population, especially in the African-American community. But for many of us it is true. It, it is good to understand the culture you're dealing with, to understand certain things are polite, certain things are impolite. If I stick my feet up on this table mm. at you, that would be impolite in certain cultures, whereas in American culture, we would probably wouldn't do it on TV, but it's not really rude. And I consider this human respect. 
Well, A, I consider it human respect, and people should do it with any culture, and sure. hope they would be the same. <coughs> but also, it is a survival skill, and realistically, uh, I mean, for example, there are certain behaviors that are acceptable in India that are not acceptable in America. Someone who comes to America learns, I don't do these, not because I have a personal problem with it, but because I don't want to bring disrespect on myself and perhaps other people don't understand my culture. It's not necessarily saying I have to be like someone else, but just dealing kind of with the practical issues of multiculturalism. And, you know, sometimes having to be the person who sees both sides, as anyone who's immigrated, for example, from one country to another can see. Mm. I saw, in a nutshell, as the saying goes, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Within the confines of Islam, of course. Yeah. And being understanding if, you know, things are sometimes not necessary according to the confines of Islam. And also knowing where you can legitimately push the boundary. And maybe that's somewhere where some uh, people who accept Islam get stuck at. Uh, for example, in certain cultures, it would not really be acceptable generally speaking, for a woman to speak in front of men, like to give a religious speech. And so you might internalize the idea after a while that if a man sees me, uh, the world's going to end and I'm going to be so <laughs> immodest and shameful. I mean, because you, you internalize things that people say. And yet, Islamically, there is definitely an advantage to modesty. Um, but there are times when you need to say things, too. And to work with those things you think that are important, to say, okay, I understand you don't want to do this, and that's okay, but it's okay for me to do this, and this is why. So to know how to kind of navigate the mm. multicultural issue when there's an issue of something better. Shalom. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go to a break now. When we come back, we'll continue this uh, discussion, inshallah. Please don't go away. Assalamu alaikum.